If you've been trading and investing in markets over the last decade, you'd be aware that excessive government spending and the Federal Reserve have helped a lot to push markets higher. According to Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson, there are some problems on the horizon. What are they? Well, today we'll take a look at stocks, commodities, and cryptos together. We'll also be talking about Tesla losing its CFO. The stock was down heavily and pushed into a key demand zone that we'll discuss. And of course, smart money versus dumb money makes a return. Huge divergences between these mean that we need to be paying attention to what happens next in the markets. Along with our thoughts on semiconductors, can they break below the key and create a double top pattern? And of course, the other two. The biggest stock in the world having an absolute meltdown while the market remains relatively high. And then there's inflation. What's going on with oil? We'll discuss it today into CPI inflation this week. Well, welcome back, everybody, to The Daily Show, where we discuss stocks, commodities, and cryptos together. We'll be going through the macro lead indicators and, of course, the hottest charts, including the indices later up in today's show. So the market was mostly green on the Monday, and it was pretty much all good except for Apple and Tesla. When we go through and we take a look at some of the big earnings results, we saw Palantir announcing a $1 billion buyback. And we also had Beyond Meat showing again why when you buy stocks, it's important to have a pretty big moat. Unfortunately, if you don't have a moat, it's going to be a problem for you. And this stock is getting absolutely obliterated in general trade throughout the last year. So let's discuss what Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley are discussing at this stage in terms of markets. Well, US M2 to nominal GDP ratio has not been something we've brought up on this channel much until now. Why? Because it's kind of well considered that unless we're underneath this long-term average, we're not really seeing tightening. In fact, in a recent article that was written by another bank, it says here, when this ratio declines below the trend is when monetary tightening will really start to bite. Meanwhile, it remains a reality that monetary tightening has not impacted many large corporates in America because they locked in their financing costs by terming out their debt. And this dynamic is going to be the most important factor over the next six months. So will we update this chart? Absolutely. Will we be looking at, of course, the pre-COVID trend? Yes. And if the market goes underneath, we'll need to be watching. Speaking of other trends this earnings season, we have now got through 421 of the S&P 500 stocks and 81% of the cap has now been completed. So basically it came in with an extremely low bar, as we can see here, and the consensus of expectations for the S&P 500 year on year was that EPS growth would fall by about 9%. However, companies that are beating consensus estimates by over one standard deviation are only outperforming the S&P 500 by 70 BPS. Now, this is less than normal. Usually, it's about 100. And the same type of trend is going across the board. So could we still get a slump through the back of August into September now we've seen earnings? That depends a lot in inflation, which we'll see later on this week. So let's now take a look at smart money versus dumb money confidence. We shared this over on our Twitter at FX Evolution. If you're interested, link in the description down below. And of course, we're talking about huge divergence between the two. While smart money seems to be not purchasing that much and selling into these rips, dumb money has been purchasing hard. And in general, you won't use this chart unless it shows you discrepancies this large. And it's been there for quite some time. The last period we saw this at was actually October of 2022, and it was the opposite way around. And while the market was bottoming off, as we now know, we saw smart money really get into it and start buying in huge swathes. So this time around, they haven't been purchasing. We are looking for this to uptick to show us that, of course, we've got that usually dip buy in. And in general, it's pretty good for that type of indication because what we're usually seeing is as the market comes down, we'll see kind of smart money take over. They'll get super excited about those dip purchases or at least more excited about them. And that's when we want to be also entering into our momentum-based trades. They'll then sell as the market rips higher. It's pretty much the same thing, rinse and repeat. So with huge divergence, we're going to be updating this chart a little bit more. So make sure to subscribe if you're interested as we follow along with whether this chart is giving us edge right now. Where we have seen big, strong growth has been consumer discretionary or sales targeting, and that's something that we will be watching. Here's the long-term futures trend in terms of what's going on with interest rates according to the market. 
and you'll notice it still remains higher for longer. This week will dictate a lot to do with what's going on in yields. And you'll want to be looking at your US two-year yields in particular and US 10-year and marking out some charts that we'll talk about later on in today's video. There's a lot to discuss there. And speaking of CPI, have we seen the signs of an increase? Well, Harbor Diesel's up and that usually precurses US CPI year-on-year -year percentage increasing. So will we see it? Well, according to this, and of course shipping, which is automatically spiking again, as you can see over here on the right-hand side, it would mark that, yeah, we're probably about to see a rise in inflation, or at least that's the guess we've got here. Will the market not like it? Well, that's the problem. Even if you get the direction or you get the idea right, which direction will the market trade? That's why we always say patience, react, don't predict. And we'll look at some of the key levels later on in today's video. The S&P 500 Ford PE ratios, do they look exciting for an investor yet? We're trading around 19.3 times at the time of this recording. It's not really an exceptional level. Usually you want to be looking at around 16.8 or 17 and under. Between 15 and 17, Ford PE is an excellent place to be. As per usual, I just want to really kind of show that We've seen a rotation into small caps recently. So if we do start to see bounces in the market, I wouldn't be surprised at all to see the likes of ARK-K and other hyper stock funds come back with a resurgence. Calls remain super elevated. This has dropped off a little bit since we've taken this number. But in general, this is where you usually see turns. And the reason we see turns is because mark this on your charts and you'll be quite surprised. The 19th of July, we saw peak FOMO in sentiment results. We also saw the high of the NASDAQ, which we've seen before. And this has led on to some sentiment and some more likely seasonal trends that were about to occur. But if you are, let's say, a bull in markets, do you have to be worried? Well, the answer is quite simply based on the data, no. If you look at holding through August and September into October, in general, while we do sometimes see some fairly significant sell-offs, by the end of the year in both scenarios here, both where we have a decline first week of August, we tend to have a 100% strike record by the end of the year. And I think that's important. While we expect increased volatility such as this during pre-election years at this period of time, and this has taken over 33 years of data, we do know that in general, there is some type of double bottoming effect. Here's another chart that we haven't shown yet, which is between 1983 and 2019. And we've scaled here 2023 on top. Where are we? Well, we're starting to drop off. And you can see here that there's usually kind of like a doubling bottom throughout September and October tends to be a much stronger period of year. Around the middle of October, we see that recovery. So will the late August bottom come this year? Well, based on this data and the statistics, it seems like it could. Here is another S&P 500 pre-election year. We're not quite at the real big sell-off yet, of course. And we also know that this just continues to be kind of the data moving forward. Let's now move on to a couple of unusual trades that have gone through over the last 24 hours. We've got a couple of large trades coming into treasuries. Now, is this important? Well, we haven't really seen a turn on treasuries just yet, but a lot of people are looking at the 20-year TLT yields because, of course, that's going to become very important into this inflation week. And I would expect treasuries to have huge trades on them. So people are positioning, whether they're getting out or getting in, we don't know just yet. We also know semiconductors are the most important market in the US to be following right now. Have they created a double top? It's potentially one, but we haven't seen a breakthrough. One of the largest trades coming through for semis over the last 48 hours. And again, there was another one in the last 24 hours. So into this earnings week, now we've seen Palantir kind of give its result. We've, of course, seen Beyond Meat, which is another one that I know a lot of people follow. We move into the next, Rivian, Twilio, Datadog, Roblox, Disney, and many others. So which ones are most people watching? I think Disney is probably on most people's charts, and we'll bring that up later on today. But make sure you have an economic calendar free. And if possible, try to always get the expected options moves before you ever trade these options weeks. Because if you're not aware of how volatile the event is expected to be, sometimes it can catch you unaware, you get destroyed, the move's like 10% or 20% negative or positive, and it blows up your account. You don't want to do that. Options markets will kind of show you the pricing and the expectation there. You can get things from earnings whispers. You can also get it from earnings watcher and a few other places. 68% beat rate, 1395, misses 658. We're pretty much at the end of this chart now for the Q2 2023 earnings beat data. I would say it was smack bang 
in the middle. Let's now jump into unusual options activity. And it wasn't a huge options trade day, but we did see some big trades coming in for AAPL. So Apple is one of the most traded options markets. Also Amazon, but look at Apple, two times almost the relative 90 day volume, and it fell another 1.7%, while most of the other markets, including the queues, were up. If you were to say to me, usually, oh, the biggest stock in the world will be down 1.7% and the market will be up on the queues, I'd say that seems unusual. Uh, however, with the rebalancing that they just did only a month ago, well, yes, it's possible now, I guess. Palantir also getting a lot of interest here on the options side, and it was kind of like up 2% or something after the hours, so not, not a huge move. And we continue to see monstrous options trades on Moderna. I think we need to start looking at Moderna, Pfizer, and a few other stocks because these are starting to really show capitulation on the charts. And you'll see what I mean when I bring them up later. As I said, options volume was horrible at 34 versus a standard 39. And call to put ratio was sitting at 54% to 46. So still showing that buy the dip is predominantly the biggest trade going around. US two-year time, we need to be watching this this week. It dr did drop off, which you know is a fairly okay deal, but you can see here it was barely down overall. You're watching 5.1% and really setting alerts also underneath the low here of 45 This will dictate a lot about certain sectors in the market. The inflation trade's been on recently. Energy's been increasing, metals have been increasing, and everybody's kind of getting on this, this train of, of trading these inflation-based trades but we haven't seen a spike increase in yields. Once we go to the unknown, that's when things will get a bit crazy. So remember to mark out 5.1% here this week, just in case, and of course underneath, and do the same with your US 10 year. Go and mark out you know, the fear of the unknown, something around 4.3 to 4.4% on the US 10 year. That will certainly spike markets. Also set some kind of overall large term alerts for JP 10 Y. The Bank of Japan came out about a week and a half ago now and made a drastic shift in policy. This is expected to potentially get to 1% over time, but I would mark 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and 1 because this could shake up a lot of what's going on in the markets. And it's already shaking up treasuries quite a lot. RSP, equal weight markets, again, they saw, saw a little bit of an increase showing that it's more of a potential rotation out of some of the bigger stocks and into the smaller stocks at this stage. Treasury is getting beaten around, huge trades going on down in these lows. But even though there's huge trades going on, we're not really seeing the signs of turnaround just yet. There could be considered like a little island reversal here, which you could have traded. But I don't think it's enough to say, oh, yes, Treasury's bottom is in. We don't know that. We will be covering it as much as we can. High yield junk bonds continue to remain relatively high considering. And this is kind of a positive for the markets and the bounce that we just saw. Though we are at a level for indices that I think where we could see markets turn around. You know, we've been looking at this level together for a little while, and this is where you would expect market indices to potentially turn. We've got that coming up later on today. Consumer discretionary versus staples. This shows us one third of the US economy kind of as a whole, still showing some strength, thanks in part and mostly to Amazon and its strength there. Magma, one of the charts we're looking at seeing if, if we ever get a turnaround and maybe some kind of uh, weekly moving average return that continues to remain stuck in a zone and copper is falling through at the time of this recording kind of showing that there's some sickness in the economy copper false broke last week weekly closed below and now it's going to put pressure on this 3.78 if we get a new low underneath around 3.7 flat that's going to push serious pressure on a lot of the economy and i expect this to have some big volatile moves coming into the inflation data and that's going to be a big deal. What about central bank liquidity? Well, of course, we've seen that continue to just moderate while the markets remain high. Nothing new on that chart. But this is a chart that I would set alerts for, and that is oil per barrel. Most people are talking about it now, which, you know, you have to be. And it's gone up to a key level of supply for bears. They're going to be looking to short it around here. And they're looking for, of course, something to do with OPEC, probably making some announcements. If it does breach out, though, it's possible it goes up to 90 plus a barrel, and we all know what that's going to do. It's going to hurt people quite a lot. 92 a barrel would be the next target, and you'd have like kind of 88 and 92. Big level breakout, good potential here on oil for both the short and the long, depending on what it does next. If you're looking for a short, we already know our lows, which are marked down here at about 78. 
a barrel. So if we get a low underneath that, because we've made a new high, it should be a turn point for the markets. We'll cover that on this show should it happen. That'll be a key one. Let's move over to dollar index. Now, the US dollar has been finding a little bit of strength. Actually, this is where you would expect somewhere in here the market to show some shorts. It has done a small time frame change of trend. So really around here is where you'd expect shorts to potentially come in. The dollar's been really strong in recent weeks and it's come up to a very key weekly level, which we marked by this green zone box and we tapped it, we sold off. And around here is where you know there is a good chance that bears may try to recommit. Look at the smaller time frames. look for the liquidity grabs. That's gonna be a key one. Gold, something similar. We saw a level here, which it's found itself at again, which theoretically could be where gold finds some buyers. If gold drops below here though, oh, it's gonna be a problem for it. Now I am a little bit of a bull gold master around here. <laughs> um, and the reason why, well, it's gonna to have to do a lot with inflation. If we see it go through 5.1%, I'm not too sure that's going to be a good deal uh, for gold. So gold might be coming under fire here. Uh, there are a lot of risks coming into inflation whenever you're trading gold or oil. Uh, these two metal, or the metal and of course the commodity tends to you know really have problems around that time. Uh, but yeah, it's at its little kind of two hour, one hour kind of buy zone. We'll find out whether it can hold the lows. And remember, it's all about replication when it comes to trades. Even if you lose one, how much ratio are you make? If you're making a two to one or three to one ratio, that is you risk $100 and you make $300 of return and you do that enough times, you do 40 reps, which is always what I say to everybody. Once you've got your 40 reps, let's say you win 24 of those 40, you might think, well, that's not very good. But if you're making two to one or three to one ratio, that's really good. So just remember, you've got to get your replication down. You have to replicate. If you're just guessing all over the place, there's not much point in being a trader or an investor really. And that's something I do definitely teach in our day trading masterclass and a few other things. If you're interested, links in the description down below. Now, Tesla, what's going on? It's come back to 240, not quite tapped the level, but this is around where that demand happens. Now, Tesla's had some trades in here and it's had some trades in here. Were they sells? I don't know yet. Um, and of course, if the market does break through here, it's marking out a pretty significant swing turn towards potential further shorting for Tesla. So there's a lot at risk at this level, but that's a strong daily coming off the bottom of the Bollinger, coming into that 242 level. If you bought down in here, I wouldn't blame you. Uh, that's a decent level down here. And from the top in terms of percentage, that's already an 18.82% discount on where it was. Now, could it go lower? Absolutely. And of course, depending on what happens this week, if we end up getting that and we close below that one now, especially on the daily, you'd have to think the further sell is going to happen. And at that point, what we're going to be doing is getting out some fibs and looking for big retracements, pulling a whole bunch of most traded levels. I'll update that in the next chart for Tesla when we see more. Dynamic resistance at the 20 moving average could be a real thing as well. So certainly mark in, I would say, around that 267 for Tesla. It was a good kind of day close, but... Yeah, look, we'll see what happens with the rest of the market. AAPL hit its weekly mean reversion. That was fast. Only took about <laughs> four or five days uh, and it fell straight back down. So this closed below its daily 20 and it just sold and sold and sold. It's kind of like in free fall almost at the moment. The most free falling market that we've seen for a while. Definitely some sell off. It's nowhere near, you know, a proper, you know, proper sell off for the stock. Uh, but, you know, you could mark here and say, well, you know, any type of discounts, good discount on the biggest stock in the world. And at the moment, you know, it went down as much as 10%, which is considered, you know, not bad, I guess. It's pulling back to May pricing and pulling back to the all-time highs here back in December of 21. Another weak earnings result, though, for it. I didn't like it. You can see it's repricing itself. And I kind of expect it to go down further. What are some of the key levels we're looking at? Well, I've pulled a fib here from the top to the bottom, which would come into that ratio. Another one could be somewhere around 165. And we'll do some more work on this over the next video day as well, because if the stock market's going to do what we think it might do, there could be more pain for Apple first. Let's talk about TAN, which is solar. No turn yet. We did see some big trade here. So we're watching this chart. But again, patience, react, don't predict is key. Uh, CQQ, KWeb, Baba, JD, Chinese stocks in general. No stimulus package really announced yet. We expect that to come later this year.
but really nice technical bases. The problem is they're not going to be momentum based. So it's unlikely they're just going to blow up and go super hard. We started talking about it down in here. It's in a positive bull sentiment. And look, the markets are up and as a percentage, it's doing okay. I mean, you know, from here to here is about seven. Certain stocks are up about 10 or 12. But yeah, I just think it looks better on the charts than you might expect. For the Australian audience out there, the XJO is pretty boring as we move into indices. There's not much going on. You could argue this is certainly a double top and therefore rally to be met by sell demand. It's just, you know, going to wait for the US. I mean, let's face it, that market looks pretty lackluster. Let's move over to the German market now. Now, this has been really weird and interesting. It, it has turned again, and you'd have to think that the distribution is still on. Now, some people are drawing it like this, basically creating a uh, kind of like a wedge pattern here or a large megaphone style pattern. And what I'm looking at is not so much the pattern. I'm just looking at the overall sentiment. So here we think about it and we've got, you know, a BC, we've got a UT, we've got a UTAD now potentially. We've also seen a switch of trend. Rallies to be met by sell demand, weakest time of the year, certainly not looking great on the charts. And that's in line with, you know, maybe maybe a little bit of weakness there from an all-time high on the German 40. US 2000 did make a new low in the previous session, however, held the close. It is looking weak. This has been a stronger market, though, than both the NASDAQ and the S&P. So, you know, key level here, if the market breaks through, next level could be 1900 for the US 2000. So some stuff to mark. Of course, closures underneath this 1947 will be key. Qs, tons of gaps to fill. We've filled one of them now, which is, of course, here. So congrats, we've got one fill of many <laughs> that are around the down low here. And we saw the market bounce a little bit. So let's have a look at the NASDAQ futures to see how they were trading. Basically, we didn't make a new, I think we just came down to the lows, but we didn't make a new low. And we've seen a lower low over here. Now, if you're a bull, you might like that initially. I think you've still got to get through 15,550. But uh, yeah, this initially looks okay on the charts. I feel that, that we still haven't really seen the sell low yet, and that's because of the time of year and a few other things coming in. But yeah, it's uh, it's key resistance up here, and I could see like a buyer trying to commit around that area if it was to happen. But let's move to the S&P because this is where it gets really interesting. We've now got a gap that needs to be filled again. We've got a gap in here, and then of course, we've got to watch this zone at 4,400. Daily 20 moving average, just like the NASDAQ daily 20 is below, we're seeing tests of the daily 20, which is the middle of the Bollinger here, from the bottom up, and it's acting as dynamic resistance. So again, it's seen a turn that we haven't had in a while. For bulls, all you really want to do is take that high out. Once you get that high, you can be a little bit smiley face. You're probably going to push even higher, go towards something like a 4580, possibly even pop a new high in. Though, for bears, you need to sell it pretty much now. In this area here needs to be where bears start to push down this market. And at the time of this recording, it's dropped off a bit. But it did have a nice recovery in it since the Friday close. So, of course, it was a buy the dip. But generally, with the things such as the daily close on the low, rallies such as this, which we expect to happen, are met by sell demand. And, of course, we're coming into that area. So, some market prices, 45.42 for a high and then, of course, anything between this 45.20 or even where it is right now, 45.20 to 45.40 would be where we'd expect bears to try to recommit to the trade short. And if they do get short, we've got gap fills at 44.4. And, of course, we've also got them at 4,400. So 4,400 would probably be the next aim for bears. Bitcoin, it just remains lackluster. You know, we talked about the idea that bulls would try to commit because of this little change of trend here. At around 29,259, we've had plenty of chances to get out of it now if we wish to. I don't really like what it's done. However, you would argue that that's a pretty nice looking bullish hammer. Um, so hopefully it does continue. Personally, I'm done with the trade because I don't like it to be sitting for so long. Uh, stops would have held plenty of chances to get out. At this stage, still looking towards weakness to 28,000. But if it breaches through 30,400 uh, plus, then that's going to be a super positive, I would think, for Bitcoin and crypto traders. And I still think Bitcoin's going to be exciting over the next six months. There's going to be some real excitement coming into the halving procedure again. People are pretty much done with it. They, they kind of, some people are excited about crypto, but it's definitely lost its luster. 
And that's usually a good time to start thinking about the processes. So on this channel, we'll talk about it more in the coming months. Of course, we have CPI coming through for China today at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then we move over to the big one Thursday, August the 10th. Oh, sorry, that was, yeah, yeah, Tuesday. And then Thursday, August the 10th, core CPI, CPI year on year expected now to be 3.3%. Could it be higher? Based on oil, you kind of think it's possible. But we're looking, of course, at what's going on with inflation. This number will move the markets. It will increase volatility. And most likely, you want to be patient and react to the market instead of probably predicting this one. It might be a bit difficult. Then we get core PPI here on Friday, which is, of course, at 8.30 a.m. If you like everything that we're doing so far, make sure to subscribe. And, of course, check out everything else over on our website, fxevolution.com. If you're interested in one of our courses, you can check it out down below. And for everyone that's keen on coming to Vegas to catch up with other members of the community, the pre-early bird sale is on fxevolution.com, top right-hand corner, and you can join us. I'd love to meet a lot of you. We've got some great speakers coming, and some of those guys will be sharing and imparting some serious knowledge and dropping some uh, some big truth bombs, I guess, for all of us in terms of inv investing, trading, and everything else. And they bring with them you know, combined a lot of experience. Thanks so much, guys. Bye for now.